There are too many things to know in the world to personally go and research everything. So we all have to outsource some of our thinking to people whom we trust, scientists, experts, teachers, parents, whoever. I take cues from Noam Chomsky, I, I trust him. Howard Zinn, Liza Featherstone, David Harvey, whoever. I click on their videos, I, I read their articles. I, I take cues from them because I trust that what they have to say has value. That's the in-group. Now, the out-group. Let's say any of the brain cretins at PragerU. In a different way, I trust them too. I can trust that whatever they have to say is fundamentally wrong in some way or another. They are a negative indicator for me. So I may take a cue from them, but it may result in an attitude backlash from me. Because when I hear Ben Shapiro talk about something he hates, it makes me like that thing, even if it's something I also hate. And so this is the concept in a paper by Eric Merkley and Dominic A. Stecula. They argue that backlash to outgroup cues from democratic elites played an important role in Republican voters becoming so averse to climate science. I.e., I saw Nancy Pelosi talking about climate change. Man, that makes me mad. I wasn't thinking about climate change, and now I'm thinking about how much I hate it, more or less. So while people are responsive to signals from their own party's elites, partisans may also be responsible to outgroup cues where they are repelled by signals from the opposing party's elites. For example, according to one of their citations, since Democratic elites were mixed on the Iraq war, but Republican elites were unified in favor of it, Democratic voter opposition to the Iraq war may have been less because some Democrats opposed it and more because all Republicans supported it. As the paper explains, a lot of the literature on opinion formation and persuasion focuses on persuasion by in-group elites, but the researchers found that the most consistent factor that predicts climate skepticism in the public are cues from Democratic Party elites. That Democratic elite cues lead rather than follow public opinion. They preempt public opinion. And so, Climate skepticism comes from both GOP cues and Democratic cues. And refreshingly, they emphasize the role of the media in this because that's how political messages are communicated to the public. When you learn about something the Secretary of State said, was it because you check the State Department's website every day? No, of course not. It's because it came filtered through your preferred news source. Interestingly, they did not find the same attitude backlash in Democratic supporters against Republican elites, which they chalk up to a ceiling effect. Democrats already accept the idea of man-made climate change, so they can't be made to accept it even more. Uh, although, and this wouldn't have been in the scope of the study, but it doesn't address the constellation of issues comprising climate change and the extent to which mainline Democratic voters support them or could be made to feel antagonistic toward them. So your average CNN viewer accepts the reality of climate change 100%. But if someone to the left of them were adamant about the need for a fracking ban and strident in the claim that centrists are climate deniers for being malleable on fracking, could that average CNN viewer have an attitude backlash and come to view anti-fracking advocacy as an assault on their politics? I would guess the answer is yes to some degree. But that's actually what really struck me about the paper. I think this concept exists in a lot of people to varying degrees. So I want to apply it to something I observed recently. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, I saw some leftists online trashing her for no reason, but they were ready to trash her as a worthless neoliberal shell whose voting record antagonizes all that she purported to believe in. And as soon as legitimate criticisms were launched into the arena, how she should have retired in 2013 and the things she said about Colin Kaepernick, those items were bandied around. And I don't blame people for doing this because the hagiography of RBG by liberals was insane. And the way her death naturally faded into feverishly blaming Jill Stein for indirectly stealing a Supreme Court pick from Hillary, that was all really annoying. And so I'll admit that when I saw the coverage, when, when the news stopped and was replaced with shallow gushing biography, I wanted to hate RBG too. And while I do think ceasing news coverage to gush about some very powerful person, whoever it is, is ridiculous, 
RBG had a pretty substantive career. Not that she's above criticism, no one is. And anyone who says it's not important to point out that she should have retired in 2013, they're just trying to shield themselves from the discomfort of an inconvenient fact. But the reaction from those leftists online had nothing to do with her career. It was just frustration with liberal pundits' obsessive coverage. And that reaction is really something that needs to be observed and controlled by all of us, because I do it too. Because invariably, at some point, your opposition's media is gonna say something of value. But if we're closed off to every single datum that comes from the mouth of someone we generally disagree with, we're likely committing ourselves to some level of ignorance. So I'm, I'm trying this thing that when I'm about to get angry about something, I try to think, would I be angry if it were someone else? Am, am I judging the action or the person? The authors of this study give a bit of a prescription for mitigating this phenomenon of Republicans being repelled by Democratic cues. They write that party elites who strongly identify with the scientific consensus on climate change or other issues must weigh the costs and benefits of aggressively communicating their stance in the mass media. If the goal is to convince as many people as possible, then by Democrats and liberal media putting Republican denialism at the center of climate change discussions, it may actually be engendering backlash denialism, and that the role of party elites in the formation of public attitudes on climate change suggests scholars should invest less time and resources in identifying messaging strategies to mobilize support for the climate consensus. Finding ways to mobilize an elite consensus across partisan lines is perhaps the most promising strategy to bring public opinion alongside the scientific consensus on climate change. So it's a good paper. Uh, the idea is really interesting. I think it's something we should probably be grappling more with. Uh, I'll link it in the description. You can go read it yourself, but that'll be it for me. Uh, if you like this video, please subscribe. It helps other people find this. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Kent Brockman. Kent, how's it going? This is Kent Brockman with a special live report from the headquarters of crusty opponent, John Armstrong. How can I prove we're live? Penis.